Hi, my name is Kelly, and this is the Mostly Modular Knitting Podcast. It is talking about modular knitting primarily, mostly. In this, my very first official episode, I'm gonna share with you some of the projects I've been working on over the last um, few years. Um, since I've been working on redoing number knitting since like 2015, I have a lot of projects that I've made from the book, bags and bags of projects. Um, but I thought it would be best to um, to start off with the one that's most recently um, been completed and um, is just about ready to be released. And um, I thought I'd, I'd start there. So behind me is a project called the Whirlpool Stole. And that's in a section of the book entitled um, Knitting in Flat Design. Uh, so she did knitting for like stoles and shawls and placemats and that sort of thing. And then she had a whole section where she knitted garments. And this was in the first section called Knitting in Flat Design. And what's, uh, what's interesting about, um, about Bellamy, um, Virginia Woods Bellamy is the author of the book from 1952, um, so what's interesting about her her method that I think differs um, from a lot of the other garter stitch books out there is that she she determined there were seven basic shapes for um, for modular garter stitch and she um, outlined them and actually got a patent for it and um, so her basic shapes are the square the rectangle the right and left triangle the divided square or mitered square, um, the divided triangle, um, the single wing, which you could also, you know, call a parallelogram, and then the double wing, which is like a chevron shape. So in this example, I have a square and all the ridges run in a single direction. But if you have a mitered shape, the ridges run at different directions. And so they're gonna be pulling on the tension of the fabric a little bit differently. And she discusses how, in her book how these um, ridges, when they run at different angles, how they affect the, um, the fabric, like how it wants to curl and um, you know, reposition itself. And the, um, the Whirlpool stole is, is interesting and because it's got, it starts with a mitered square and then you do right and left triangles, uh, two little ones and then two big ones. And then you do a, um, a divided uh, triangle in the center. And so, uh, because all those ridges are running at different directions, it's going to affect the um, the behavior of the fabric, and they have different degrees of pull, which I think is is really interesting. I haven't seen that I haven't seen that addressed in other modular knitting books, to be honest with you. Uh, another thing that she did that was really interesting is that. Um, she, you see how the, the units at the bottom um, down here, two and three, they're, um, they are roughly the same shape, like they cover the same amount of distance on the edge of that um, base triangle um, next to them. But then units four and five, they actually come across two, um, both units one and two. But what Bellamy did that was really interesting um, is that she makes her shapes in different sizes. She's not necessarily um, so concerned with that all the shapes need to be the same size. So some of, sometimes in her designs, the shapes are big, some of them are small. It's all how uh, she chose to design them on graph paper. So this is the first of three patterns that specifically demonstrate these, um, the idea of garter stitch squares being knitted one onto the other. Um, for this particular piece, um, you start with unit one, knit, and then unit two, unit three, and then unit four. Interestingly, you see how she's wearing this? It's it's basically just a square. I think it's a 24 inches square. And somehow they managed to photo style it like that. Um, 
this is actually the same the same garment and the um the photo stylist um put on this snazzy necklace and made it look like a uh i don't know some sort of like a bustier top but it's really this is the same as this The next item in the book that kind of demonstrates this is the checkerboard design table mat. And again, it's um, it's just modular squares knitted one right after the other. And this one I actually have a an example of. So you can see, this would be unit one, unit two, unit three, four, five, and six. The next item in the book that is along this, um, this same concept is called um, Baby Blanket. It's on page 69. The What's interesting about this is the orientation of the the squares or the direction in that they're knitted, it's it differs from pattern to pattern. And I think that's because she was trying to avoid yarn breaks. And so um, she had this one in, um, I think pink, pink, white, and blue is um, where it's, how it's described in here, but it's it's charted in to be, oh yeah, here it is, pink, pink, blue, and white. Um, and the, the little lines in those squares, um, indicate like the the color that you're supposed to use um, and so this one is is interesting because it it um it kind of works from a corner to corner and then you like go in and fill fill in the edges um, but all three of these designs are based on the idea of modular squares just knitted one right after the other Now the, the beauty of these modular squares is that you can knit them in a lot of different um, directions. Um, let's say you started here and you wanted to knit down and across. And so you could knit um, a row of these. You could start here in the center and work out. Um, there's You could start in the center and work out and then work back and forth once it's um, you know, the size that you need. Like if, you, if you've if you got it square enough and then you need me to like build it out, you could do that. So the flexibility of modular squares is, um, is pretty nice. You don't have to start with, you know, 400 stitches or whatever. You can simply start with um, the size of the unit that you wanna work with and then build off of that one. Um, and so like this one, for example, you see those little safety pins there? Uh, for this hat, I started in the, the center and I worked out until I got it as big as I wanted. And then I started going around the, um, the circle top part of the hat to then make the body. And this isn't in garter stitch because I wanted to um, I wanted to make these little pink stripes pop. Um, I know this this whole number knitting book is all about garter stitch, but even if you don't, even if you decide to knit your modular units in something other than garter stitch, the knitting is generally pretty, um, it's pretty adaptable, it's pretty flexible. And so it's, you know, it's still gonna be roughly square, even if you don't, um, if you don't choose to use garter stitch for all of your modular units. In one of my earlier videos, I went through and I actually read the whole um, introduction out loud, um, page by page. Wanted to give you all a kind of a, a better understanding of the background behind the, the book. Um, and so I thought I'd, you know, proceed with sharing more about the rest of the book. 
she because Bellamy she wrote this book um, and it was her own method and it was based on a correspondence class that she um, that she sold to students around the world it's organized a lot differently than most other knitting books of the time um, most of their knitting books were developed in conjunction with yarn manufacturers and so there wasn't this overall cohesive kind of a um, a style behind the the projects in the book and I have some knitting books they don't even have any knitting instructions they're like 250 pages of patterns and like <laughs> there's nothing that tells you how to knit or cast on or anything uh, which I think is interesting so she talks uh, here about um, tools that you'll need um, different kinds of yarn and what she did though I think was really interesting that a lot of it, it doesn't get enough credit, I think. Um, she talks about roughly four gauges of yarn. And if you're familiar with the American uh, Craft Yarn Council, they have like, I think, eight different weights of yarn um, in their standardized sizing. But back in the 40s and 50s, like I have one knitting book, and I think there's like 47 different kinds of yarn listed, and they were listed by brand name. Or, um, or simply like baby wool um, or cotton floss without any, um, any necessarily a weight or yarn construction method listed. But she, I think, was the, the first person to kind of try to standardize these yarn weights into four different, um, four different weights, which I think is, that's phenomenal. So kudos to Bellamy for that. She also came up with this um, a, approximate gauge she wanted, she wanted the knitters to try out the different um, weights of yarn using different needles and give like a rough estimation of what their yarn gauge would be using the various needles. Now, obviously we know that if you knit a uh, fingering weight yarn that's superwash, uh, single ply, it's going to knit up a heck of a lot different than a fingering weight um, eight ply sock yarn. Uh, there's just, the, the yarn construction has a lot to do with how your your fiber or how your yarn is going to knit up, um, also cotton yarn is going to knit up a lot different than silk than than wool. Um, so this was this was a very rough approximation, but I think it's it is noteworthy that she uh, was empowering the knitter to take control of her gauge rather than simply blindly follow the needle size recommendation for whatever um, you know the yarn company specified. So she also uh, next talks about how to knit. In her book, she uses the, she says the knitted on cast on. This is the only cast on that's even mentioned. And um, I have several other knitting books of the time. And I, this is always one of the ones that was common in the other knitting books. I think one of them was a mid-century uh, book from the UK and it used the um, long tail cast on. But in her book, she only offers one cast on method and it is the knitted on cast on. I actually have several videos uh, here on my YouTube channel about various cast on methods that I use for number knitting. So be sure to check that out if you're, um, if you're curious to know which one works uh, the best. Because for years, I just did long tail cast on. Um, but honestly, it, it doesn't doesn't work well for number knitting. The edge is so it's, it's beautiful. It's pretty, it's smooth, but it doesn't, um, it's harder to pick up than, um, than some of these other cast ons with like a chain stitch edging on them. Uh, okay. So next Bellamy talks about, you know, how to knit instructions for that. And then she goes into her, her rules. And this is one of the places that I kind of got I kind of got a little stuck because she talks here about four rules to remember. The box must be numbered, cast on and off with extreme looseness, slip the first stitch and purl the last stitch of every row, and all increases or decreases are made regularly and in the same position every other row. Okay, that seems pretty straightforward. But then, if you fast forward a few pages... She goes, she has projects for how to knit each of the seven shapes. Okay, so in this next section called Rules, Symbols, and Abbreviation, 
it starts off with rules, which is interesting because a few pages earlier, we had rules and there was four of them. But then you fast forward and now there's seven rules. So this, this is, this confusion, how many rules are there? Are there four or seven? <laughs> this is one of the reasons it's been taking me so long to, um, to attempt to republish this book because I'm trying to work through the, <laughs> this sort of detail. Is it duplicated information or is it additional? Um, and so working with pattern testers and my editor has been really helpful in, um, in working through that. So anyway, I decided um, because four of these, these four are also in here, I've, um, I've decided to go with just the seven rules um, for my, my new version. And instead of calling them rules, we're, um, I'm calling them points for success. I think that's less, um, maybe more friendly rules. It sounds sort of heavy handed. Oh, but then it says these rules will come naturally after you start to knit. Anyway. a big shout out to my friend DJ over at Discovery of Stitches Yarn. She is an amazing yarn dyer. Her job is small, but she does some great stuff. She designed the yarn uh, for this Whirlpool stole pattern. She also dyed the yarn for the No Breaks Cowl. And this is an asymmetrical dip dyed yarn. This particular pattern is, um, it's really important that it's just, um, it's, it's not a hand painted. It needs to be dip guide to get those, um, those really nice color breaks. So um, if you are into um, to dip dyed yarn, which is awesome for color pooling, or you have um, a special project in mind that you, um, you wanted some other custom yarn dyed for, I highly recommend you check out DJ's shop she does great with um, collaborative um, kinds of projects, and um, I know you'll be thrilled. Thank you again so much for joining me today and following along as I talk about number knitting. Now, all the feedback that you gave me last time was super helpful, and I'm just I'm very very encouraged that you subscribed and um, are are interested in my little channel and um, and the projects that I'm working on. If there are any questions or things that you'd like to know about the book, um, feel free, ask them in the comments. And um, the, the more feedback and participation that I get from you all on this, the more fun it's gonna be and the more that we'll all learn together. So thanks a lot, until next time.